Hello and welcome to OT, the podcast. We're here to talk about watches, time and how to spend it. My name's Philly Schultz. I'm with... Andy Green. Hi, Andy. How are you? Very good. Very yeah. excited. Yeah, it's a pretty good guest today. Yeah, he's a bit of an unusual character, not someone you'd come across. He's, if you checked him out on LinkedIn, his profile would certainly stand out. Mate, not only can you check him out on LinkedIn, you can check him out on Wikipedia. Whoa. So yeah. he's an Olympian. He is an ex-RAF Typhoon fighter pilot. With a distinguished flying cross. He has one of those. He's also a, a very passionate mental health advocate. And watch lover. Mm. Last but not least. Who could it be? Roger. Roger Crookshank. We'll last chat to him in a little bit. But before that, what have you liked? Felix, I have liked something uh, something British. Seems appropriate. It feels, feels very appropriate for today. I've liked two things, but the first thing that I've liked... Barracuda jackets. Have you heard of Barracuda? Yeah, the song by heart. Not the song by heart, but they're a famous British jacket. Uh, they've been made in England since 1937. Mm. And they're basically famous for the iconic Harrington jacket. So, you know, like solid block colour on the outside and then like a tartan sort of lining. Yeah, sort of like a, almost like a bomber jacket, like a bit sort of. Like the gentleman's bomber. Yes. It's got a colour, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's worn like uh, Leonardo wore it in. I was looking at some uh, cheap Harrington jackets on ASOS the other day. Is this the same deal? <laughs> well, you've just ruined the brand deal that I was trying to line up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they're worn from anyone, everyone from like uh, Leonardo wore it in Once Upon a Time in Mexico. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hollywood. Uh, Hollywood, yeah, yeah. Mexico's uh, the other one. The other dude. Uh, Paul Newman, Steve McQueen have worn the. James Dean. Elvis. Oh. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's truly an iconic. Jacket. So the one that I was going to get for 50 bucks on ASOS. No, 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 don't do that. This okay. is worth it. Because right. I don't mind spending a, a bit of coin when it's something that's got you know, a bit of legit history, um, some you know, brand pedigree, a bit of character behind it. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not fashion. It's, it's more style. It's something that's going to be around. And the fact that it's been around for like 80 years. How much coin am I talking? Uh, like two to 300 pounds. So like mm. five to 600 bucks. So that's eight ASOS jackets. I could have one. Okay, so stop talking about ASOS. <laughs> What I'm have trying you to liked? line up an ASOS deal. What? It's probably the smarter one to play, actually. <laughs> Affiliate links. That's where Affiliate it's at. Links. No, um, I've been inspired by our, uh, our guest, our, by Roger. Okay. And I've gone with an, an Instagram account that uh, Cole from Hadinki got me onto. Was, okay. He reshared something because Cole's a bit of a plain buff. Mm. So he got me onto an Instagram account, and I'm going to probably say this wrong, Cessnature. That makes sense. Cessnature. He, it is uh, some, a guy, I guess, he's, he's a plain guy, who's been unearthing obscure slices of aircraft design and aviation history. What's, uh, what does that look like? Well, uh, can you see the picture on the, the screen there? I can, but the listeners can't. Yeah. No, I'm going to ex- paint a picture of words. Basically, imagine your conventional uh, jumbo jet and then turn mm-hmm. it into a pickup truck. This is a, apparently a concept huh? plane called the Lockheed Flatbed Concept. It's nuts. It didn't actually happen. But they made, they sort of did the maths on it to like a heavy lift jumbo jet where you can just drive some tanks on the back. Right. And this is a concept that didn't get made? No. But there's, there's all sorts of wild, wacky stuff on this Instagram account. And I kind of like to think of it as the aviation equivalent of wacky car design from the 50s and 60s and 70s. Cool. When it was, they, they did wacky stuff. They put fins on things. They mm. thought about atomic powered cars, but on planes. It's crazy. It's really, really interesting. So what's the account again? Cessna Tour. All right, we'll link that up. Yeah, we will because you won't be able to spell it from that weird French pronunciation. Anyway, enough of the stuff we've liked. I've got one more thing. Oh, what? Don't cut me off. Oh, mate. Yeah, sorry, mate. Uh, This one is a bit more, even more so uh, relevant to today's guest. It's a G-Shock. It is a, you sound very intrigued. It's a uh, (laughs) G-Shock done in collaboration with Honda Jet, which is, you know, the Honda aircraft company. Yeah, they've made the uh, cheap jet plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, maybe. So it's a it's a new model. It's the GWR B one thousand HJ. Oh, I know it well. You know it well. It's part of their Gravity Master line. I was about to say. Yeah, it is. So it's a really cool new release. It's got a twelve o'clock subdial that has like a plane motif as an indicator. It looks like a little Honda jet. It does. It's there's a bit of branding on there. Uh, it's got some cool polished crowns, which kind of again are an ode to the Honda jets, but the rest is sort of blacked out. Yeah, sure. It's cool, a tough cool, cool. looking watch. Yeah, it's a G Shock. It's a G Shock, but it's got this uh, triple G resist tech. Do you know about this? Um, I'm pretty sure I've I listened to their first album. 
<laughs> no, no. So it's the the uh, it's a tough structure that they build into the this particular model yeah. uh, to withstand three main types of gravitational acceleration. This is not just their ten meter. Test so it's not just dropping shocks. It's centrifugal force and vibrations. So I can take it to the gravitron. Yep. Google nice. centrifugal force uh, if you want to go yeah, down another be, rabbit hole. No. Oh, really? Well, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, price next week on things we've liked. Price of thousand sixty-five US dollars. Sick. We'll link it up. Uh, but it's cool because I think we're talking a lot about planes, G-Shocks and piloting things. Mate, we're on brand today. Let's get him on the line. But before we do, <sighs> yeah, we're going to take a quick break. Sorry, guys. Back in a moment. Today's episode of OT The Podcast is brought to you by William Wood Watches. William Wood are a smaller independent brand. They're based in the UK and they've been around for a few years now. What sets William Wood apart is their design ties to the firefighting service stemming from the founder's connection. So they're named after William Wood, who's the founder's grandfather. He was a legit firefighter and had a a bunch of accolades. And the watchers incorporate some nice firefighting touches. Like their logo, which is an old-style firefighter's helmet, but the really cool part, the straps seen on their Valiant collection, which are made up from upcycled British fire hoses. Yeah, I also thought the crown was really cool. It's been made Mm -hmm. from a fire brigade brass helmet that dates back to the 1920s. Their Valiant collection is the Divers Range. It's water resistant up to 100 metres and powered by your choice of Swiss or Japanese movements. Now those straps I mentioned, Felix. Yeah. So aside from being sustainable, they are made from upcycled fire hoses that would otherwise have been tossed aside. Super cool. And we've actually been wearing a piece from the collection each. I've been wearing the Red Watch, which comes on a matching red rubber strap. And I've gone for the Rose Watch with the yellow rubber strap. It's a classic style diver. It's got a nice sandwich dial and there's some cool two-tone elements going on. How are you liking that strap, Andy? What surprised me is the unique details, which makes sense as every strap is slightly different, making it feel a little bit more special. It retains a smokiness to it as well, which is pretty cool. Mm, Certainly uh, something different. I think they're really comfortable and I can see them working on a bunch of watches, which is kind of good because you can buy them separately. Speaking of, the Valiant Collection features a quick change spring bar on both the rubber and the bracelet straps. How good? Makes changing them easy peasy. And I have to mention the military fire hose strap, which is a khaki S green, right up my alley. (laughs) Did you see they also released a bronze edition that should be ready early 2021? I did, man. It's going to look cool, worn in and patinaed up. Indeed. Now, Time for something a little bit more serious. William Wood caught our attention earlier this year when they donated a watch in support of the Australian bushfires, and that individual piece raised 4800 US dollars. Being based in Melbourne, that's a pretty important cause for us and for William Wood, and that amount is much more than the retail price of a William Wood Valiant. Correct. Price between 695 and 995 Great British Pounds, or roughly 1500 to 2000 Aussie dollars, depending on which movement you go with. And how many extra straps you buy. So if you're in the market for a new diver, check out William Wood Watches who are upcycling service materials for a new life on wrist. Once forgotten, now reborn. When you buy a William Wood Watch, you're not just buying a great watch. You're also giving back to firefighting communities that really need our support now more than ever. This year so far, they've raised over 10,000 United States dollars for international firefighting charities. They also donate to firefighting charities in the UK with every sale. For more info or to purchase one of their timepieces or unique straps, visit williamwoodwatches.com. Now let's get back to the show. Well, today's guest is a ex-RAF fighter pilot uh, who was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. He's not just, he's also an ex-Olympian. Ex-Olympian. And he's, he's had his fair share of injuries as well along the way. Yeah, sure. He's also um, uh, passionate about, you know, mental health advocacy and, yeah, an all-round Great guy. Great guy. Likes his watches as well, which is, is how he came to us. And Roger Krukshank, great to have you on the show. How are you today? Hey, guys. It's, um, I'm, I'm doing really well. And, um, yeah, thank you very much for having me on the show. I'm, I'm really looking forward to chatting to you guys. Thank you so much. Now, we know, uh, we know a bit about you, but you've had this sort of blended uh, Olympian uh, skiing career mix that kind of pivoted into a really, like, long and successful uh, albeit injured, uh, military career as well. Why don't you just tell us sort of how you got started skiing and then we'll get into, you know, the military stuff. Skis and then planes. Yeah. <laughs> fast, fast things. <laughs> my my, fav- my favourite things right there, exactly. And uh, anything that is, um, results in adrenaline um, is probably uh, definitely sums me up. <laughs> so, yes, when I was, um, when I was young, uh, 
when I was five on my second ever skiing lesson, I broke my leg. So that was the, the oh. start to my skiing career. Um, but um, but you know what? That didn't hold me back as I was racing. I begged my parents to give me back on skiing at skis by the, the age of nine. And then off I was into the race for the um, managed to get into the British senior team by the age of about 16. Nice, so, well done. I mean, Impressive. skiing was just massive. It was just, oh, thank you. It was, you know, it was, it was like massive in my world at the time. And, and you know, going through that. I actually have a, a newspaper article of when I was 10 years old um, where I stated in there that my ambition was to ski in the Winter Olympics. You know, so I was, I was just had that as my clear focus and, and I was addicted to, to ski racing. Um, I mean, to be honest, still am if I could, um, but we'll, we'll come to that. Um, so I, um, yeah, age of 16, I reached this sort of fork um, in my uh, career where I simply didn't have the money to continue. And my parents just, you know, didn't have them. They were about to go bankrupt because of my mm. ski racing were pretty close. Um, and there's just not enough money in the sport, being a, a lowlander sport, as they call it, uh, in the um in the UK, it was always going to be um, a bit of an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, however, uh, I, I met um, what well, so I was chatting to my godfather. who's was in the navy, and he said, "Oh, Ross, you should, um, should you know join the join the navy." I was like, "What you know? What would you want to do in the forces?" And I, I told him, "Well, actually, I would love to fly jets. You know, I've always wanted to fly jets." And growing mm-hmm. up with my dad, just fascinated with World War One and World War Two aircraft, uh, I was like. Uh, you know, it must have rubbed off of me. So, um, so he said, "Well, oh, come, come on to the HMS Invincible, and uh, where he worked as a captain at the time." And um, yeah, show you around when the jets in there. So it was the the Harrier. Oh, um, and it was just incredible. I was absolutely like, "Oh, this, this is exactly what I want to do." Yeah, wow. And and that and, and actually, I remember being uh, cycling with the what was that Scottish team at the time down uh, at and uh, in the Cairngorms in Scotland. And I remember seeing a uh, higher jump jet come over my head, uh, you know, doing what what would have been now, you know, about 500 miles an hour. And I said to my mate, I was like, um, uh, that is what I'm going to do. And I was just, I was just, I, I was so, it was like another um, ambition that was so clear to me. I was going to, you know, go for it. But I didn't really have the self-esteem. I didn't have the self-confidence to know, like, that I would be good enough to do it. And yeah. When I, you know, met other people who were pilots, sort of, um, I was always questioning myself. But mm. luckily, I had enough people around me. You know, my dad, my godfather, and my mum. who just said, "No, just go for it. Give it a shot. You know, what have you got to lose?" So, so it was, you know, the, the perfect thing where I, um, we were going to run out of money anyway with skiing, so I couldn't continue with skiing. We were always constantly like every every month trying to fork out for sponsorship trying to find sponsorship from anyone who would listen but we just couldn't really get any to to make the the, the costs yeah so sure. i joined up to the air force and got addicted to that very quickly as i was um after my first application they gave me a, a flying scholarship which was amazing uh, 20 hours free flying um and that was one of the best days where I did my my first ever solo flight um, with the sun coming down. It was in uh, Tayside Aviation, so Fife Airport. And then as I, I, I finished that, I, I landed, got an aircraft, and then I got a big hug from my dad mm-hmm. and then got in the car. And that was the first time then I got to drive uh, the car you know, with my provisional license at the age of 17. So I was actually flying on my own before I was driving on my own, which is weird. But that was, that was you know, someday uh, that I'll never forget. And it just, you know, it just, just underpinned my my desire to be a pilot. So uh, fast forward, I then get into the, um, the British ski team, actually make the senior team. Yep. Um, and that was just at the same time the Air Force said, oh, well, you we're accepting you and you can come and start your officer training. Yeah, so okay. I got some decisions to, to make. By... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was a, and some tough decisions as well. But then, you know, I clearly, I just simply didn't have the money to continue the ski racing. Even in the British senior ski team, it was uh, too expensive. Hmm. So, and I've got two sisters, and it was just becoming like it just wouldn't be fair on them. And it's them taking all the family money, you know, to be able to continue on with my sport. So, um, but then I was, I had such a dream to be a fire pilot. So it was, it was an easy decision for me to make, to be honest, to give up one dream and pursue the other. Hmm. 
Um, you know, I was very, very fortunate that that was the case. So uh, off I went into Air Force, pretty much started uh, boozing and even had a few cigarettes <laughs> along the way. Um, sorry, Dad, if you're listening. And, Probably um, is global. And then, uh, <laughs> and then as the... Uh, because, I mean, that was certainly not allowed in the British ski team, that's for sure. Um, and then as I got through that, the, the RAF ski team got in touch and said, look, we want you, we need you, we need to beat the Army. You know, very clear. It's like, sure, okay, your mission. Go, right, I'll get weight yeah. training again. And yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, and then as I went through that, then the uh, I went to the RAF Championships. And fortunately, you know, I, I come from a professional ski racing background, so I had a clean sweep there. And then luckily in, in service as well. Uh, did really well and and, um, and picked up all the all the silverware, uh, which was you know fantastic. But yeah, then off right. the back of that, some senior officers started asking me like, "Hey, um, why are you doing this? Why why are you not ski racing for the British team?" So I explained about the mind situation, the fact that I want to be a fighter pilot, and um, but then they very very kindly gave me this opportunity um, to do a four year sabbatical until the 2006 Olympics. Um, so that was where I could train uh, full time and follow the program of the British ski team, and then and do some temporary work with the Air Force whenever I was home in the UK, and and that's what I did until until the year 2006 Olympics was well that was the plan, and um, so I obviously first had to qualify, which I was nervous about even at the beginning because I certainly was nowhere near the qualification criteria, mm. um, and then. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, it was just a, you know it was a great thing I had going with the British team and the RAF, just amazing support. And you know now I had money <clears throat> to be able to continue um, doing what I loved, and and I was getting faster and faster. And in fact, in 2005, I from the back of the pack in a, uh, what was a North American Cup race in Louise in Canada, I crossed the finish line. I was clocked in 146 kilometers in that race. Uh, sorry, 146 kilometers an hour in that race. It was, a, it was a good one. It was pretty pretty icy and fast and dark. And uh, I remember crossing the line straight into third position and knocked actually uh, uh, a world champion who, or who became a world champion, knocked him off the podium. Uh, and with that, I, I qualified for the Olympics. So it was just an amazing day, amazing day. Um, and then fast forward, went back to Germany for an international race, not really a big race at all. It was almost just really for race experience. Yeah, sure. And I had a classic ski racing crash where I fell on my inside on on this really icy section. And usually with that ski racing, you try and dig your edges back in and push up using your inside hand to, to get those edges to grip again. But because there'd been a lot of snowfall overnight, they'd push the snow off the side of the icy section underneath and it created these banks of snow on, on the side of the, of the racing line. So as I was sliding the ice, I tried to dig in my edges, but at the same time, I hit this bank of snow. Mm. My leg hyperextended, so bent the, the wrong way, sort of bent backwards and twisted at the same time. So in the end, my femur, so the thigh bone, punched into my tibial plateau, so the top of the shin Jeez. bone, and just crushed it. Yes. So, uh, yeah, it was... Um, some some pretty uh, loud screaming at the time because it was I you know broken most bones in my body from ski racing and from mountain bike racing back in the day as well so uh, this was uh, tasty. Um, I managed to. Uh, uh, <laughs> it, it took um, it took a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, and I think it was eight days until they found out what was actually wrong with my leg because <clears throat> they tried all the scans, the uh, uh, bone scans, the. Uh, CT scans, MRIs and things, but they just couldn't figure out uh, what was going on. It's because my bone had disappeared because your bone actually, if it's hit in a certain way, it'll crush like honeycomb. So they had to take bone from my, my hip and from my pelvis and they had to rebuild the tibial plateau, so the, the top of the tibia, the top of the shin bone, um, and using nine pins, nine titanium pins and a, a titanium plate which is um, half the length of my shin bone. So it's like a scaffolding technique um, to make up my, my left leg. Um, and from that, I mean, I, I remember where I was told before that, oh, we're not really quite sure what's wrong with your leg, said the surgeon. So a I'm going to go and have a look with an arthroscopy. <laughs> I'm going to go and have a look with an arthroscopy, have a, have a little sniff around. 
Worst case is I might put some metal work in there, but um, and I won't you know, we'll be able to tell you uh, in, right. until I yeah, it'd be, it'd be all right. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> so I remember him waking up, uh, waking me up after this mammoth um, uh, time on the dental anesthetic uh, for the surgery, uh, where I think it was a, like a three-hour job or something he spent uh, over over midnight, and I was just zonked out on morphine, and he sort of uh, woke me and said, "Yeah, well, mate, um, um, yeah." I have to say that uh, it's you know we've managed we've managed to fix but the fix you like but uh, you've got a lot of metal work in there <laughs> and then I pretty much uh, passed out again. So I remember waking up you know the next morning going so what metal work have I got in my leg? And then they showed me the scan uh, and I was like oh yeah that's that's a lot. Um, so it was you know not something that I was uh, briefed about before. It was a complete shock and but fair play to him you know. It's um well, it's still working now. So yeah, they did what they um, had to do. But afterwards, yeah, yeah. Now this like, wasn't exactly. uh, this wasn't um, game over like most uh, most people are probably thinking right now. This sounds it's pretty horrific, but you had a comeback. You yeah yeah you you had a comeback. Uh, so this was not that long before the two thousand and six Olympics, right? Yeah, exactly. So this was, um, at that point, it was 10 months before uh, the Olympics. Oh, plenty of time to so, kind of get back, back on, on this case. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And then that's what I was um, hoping for, and that's what you know my coaches were like, yeah, 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 you'll be fine. I'm sure it's not a big injury. But then as it um, amounted to, um, you know, no, no one ever knew that they were going to put in nine pins in a plate. So the the surgeon afterwards said, Sorry, Roger, to break it to you, but you're never going to ski race again. Uh, you'll never ski again. You'll um, you probably won't be able to run again, and you'll always walk with a limp. Whoa! And, and does this would this put your sort of flying I mean, career on ice too? Yeah, exactly. That was the that was the thing. So it was like a double blow. You know, my, I, as I said before, my clear ambition was to be a fighter pilot and to be um a ski racer. And I was I was so close. I've got accepted into the flying world and I had just recently qualified for the Olympics. So I mean I, I was I was a broken man, you know, in in state floods of tears in the toilets, you know, trying to put a brave face on in front of the surgeon, but I just I couldn't believe that everything just been taken away from some silly crash. You know, it wasn't even a big spectacular crash. It was boring. Yeah, frustrating. <laughs> so I remember thinking, oh, you know, yeah, it was just the the one that you didn't really expect to ever cause that sort of outcome. So um, at that moment, one of the things the surgeon said is, like, "Oh, you'll have full blown arthritis in ten years as well." So it was just it was just a horrible thing looking at the rest of my life, going, "Oh no, this is this is going to be you know really bad. They're going to affect me in a, a pretty horrible way." And you know, thinking, "Oh, they might kick me out of the air force because I can no longer do my job um, or my the job that I signed up to do." Uh, I don't really want to do anything else in the Air Force was my, you know, opinion at the time. So, but then I got over that and, you know, wiped the tears, got out of the toilets and went, right, I've got nothing else to lose. What else can I do? I can only try and get back on, on skis and try and qualify for the Olympics. I don't care what he says. I, I knew about people and had read about people, especially at the time, who had, you know, got over some severe injuries and gone on to do, you know, miraculous things. So I was like, I'm going to be one of those people. That's it. You know, I don't care what, what people say. But I mean, even the team doctor at the time was saying that I wouldn't be able to, um, you know, get back on skis. So it, it was, I had to almost convince people that I could do this. <laughs> so is this where we have the heroic training montage yeah. with the Rocky music and, uh, you know, <laughs> everything goes perfectly and then you're, you're at the Olympics? So. Give us the sort of the, the chariots of fire comes on yeah. and you're skiing down a hill. So, so what, so the rehab, the rehab went well. Well, yeah, it was um, as you can imagine, it was long and painful. Where I, I couldn't let my leg hang down, so I had to keep it horizontal or up for approximately three months on on the couch at my mum's house. Yeah, and um, with mum being a, she used to be a nurse, so she, you know she was looking after me and. But there's not much I could do apart from so do that and then go to the physio because it's all about getting the movement back in the leg and um, and trying to break through all the scar tissue to get that full movement so therefore you can get all the the muscle growth as well. But the rehab was was pretty full on. It was um, a, a five day affair with with a couple of days off. So 
pretty much my working hours. The Air Force very uh, fortunately just said, look, just go and get better. You know, the only thing you can, you can do to potentially get your, med- uh, your medical category back is to go and get better. Um, so I was, you know, it was like almost eight until six every day, just um, training away, uh, doing various things wherever I could. Um, and uh, yeah, and eventually uh, I got back on skis after about four months. And, um, oh, wait a sec, sorry, four months to go, I should say, four months to go until the Olympics. Um, and with that, I had a lot of pain in my leg, as you can probably imagine. Um, there was just so much, the nerve endings were just going nuts. And because of this alien metalwork in there, um, it was really sharp pain as well. So it was, it was quite hard. You know, it's not as if you could just push through it. Um, so with a lot of ibuprofen and a massive knee brace, I started to get somewhere. And I started to get a bit more faith. And then I met someone, Dom in Norton, who uh, I wrote the book with, uh, Speed of Science Around the Mind. And he's a high-performance coach, and he gave me some really good techniques to just focus on the positives and, and, and focus on things which would deny me, you know, thinking, oh, the pain or, oh, this. Or, you know, I could just get through that and almost sidestep that, that mental thoughts and, and not be concerned that because of the pain it meant that I shouldn't be there doing that because you know that's the automatic thing isn't it if, if your body's giving you pain it's just like your mind is like I need to stop doing this you know, but actually I just had to find a way where I could push through the pain and know that the pain was okay you know and it wasn't going to stop uh, it, it wasn't going to give me further complications and to be honest I had nothing to lose at the time as well so you might as well um, give it your all so I managed yeah exactly exactly there was just yeah, nothing to lose. Give my all and and hope that. I mean, I had nothing else, nothing else mm. to to worry about because the Air Force were supporting me. The British ski team was still supporting me. Although I even remember my head coach when we were training down, uh, I think the runs in Austria at the time. He would just turn his back because <clears throat> he'd pretty much given up on me. You know, I, I had very fortunately I had my own coach, but the head coach, as he told me afterwards, he just didn't think I'd ever make it. He didn't think I'd qualify again. Um, he didn't think it was possible, um, so jokes on him. I was, I was very much like prove people wrong. Yeah, right. So <laughs> yeah. we did a sport. We, we spoiled it at the start when we said Olympian. So you've how did you get back in? So so you've you've got in. Did you have to qualify again? Yeah, I did because the British, um, the Olympic or you know the institute, they took away my qualification because of the extent of my injury. So I had to prove my form again, which would obviously be with another qualification. So the last chance I had was a was a Europa Cup, and I'd never got well. My best position, best result was a 30th in Europa Cup, and there was the one and final chance, which was a Europa Cup in uh, Italy, and I was at the back of the pack because I was you know recovering from this um, injury as well, um, so my points weren't exactly great, and. I'd, I was a bit scrappy in the warm-up runs, but then again, like I, like I said, nothing else to lose, so let's just go for it and, and see what happens. Um, and I remember have, going down that that race and having a flashback because I fell on my hip again and slid on the ice. And this time I was doing about 70 miles per hour, but it was instinctive, you know, I just put, pushed myself up and dug the edges back in because that's what you do in ski race. You fall so many times in training that it's just a thing that you do. Mm. And luckily my edges gripped and off it was, but geez, that flashback in my head oh, and, and then re- the resulting pain, you know, cause your mind connects the, the or remembers very much that pain as well. But um, it probably just made me go faster because I was like, well, I've got through that you can get through anything. Off we go. And then as I, I finished, it was like a big jump into the finish area, about 70 meters. I land and cross the finish line. You're absolutely reaching for the finish line at about, I think, 80 miles an hour at that point. And then I see my uh, physio, Sandy Lyle, um, my, you know, my biggest supporter at the time because we were just having to, mm. to work through all of my injuries and everything. And, um, yeah, she was just jumping up and down, going crazy with a massive smile on her face. And, and when I eventually slowed down and I looked up the scoreboard, I'd gone into 17th and I qualified Damn. the Olympics by 600 of a second. Wow. So I was just... Uh, just, just incredible. Like just that, you know, that experience. Then, you know, like my phone was just constantly ringing because all the news reporters, um, you know, because no one, no one thought I could do it. And, you're, like a, you're like a Hollywood. You story. know, I, I thought I. <laughs> yeah, it was. 
I mean, but but when I look back, it, you know, the odds were definitely against me. Um, and like, I, I never doubted myself, but I wouldn't say, I was like, oh, I knew I could do it. It's not so much that. I just had nothing else to lose. So I thought, well, I'm going to give it my all and I'll try my best, but that's all I can do. You know, there's, there's, I've got nothing to worry about. I'm quite happy just trying to be as fast as I can. You know, it was a really, it was actually that whole period in my life was a really happy place to be because I had just such a clear focus. I didn't have to worry anything apart from trying to be as mm. fast as I could be. Yeah, cool. So, so you've qualified. What, what, what was next? Was it the, the Turin Olympics that year? Yeah, so so they had to uh, scramble to get all the 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 stuff because of my late notice um, Olympic qualification. So I arrived as uh, so a couple of bags of goodies, which is amazing. <laughs> if I remember that, and then off the off the Olympics, and uh, I competed in the the downhill and the super G, uh, and finished thirty seventh in both events. Amazing, it was about a field of sort of eighty or ninety. Nice, uh, so, you know. So I was I was I was really happy with that because I mean, just for me to be there to have qualified, I was. I was stoked with that result. So, and hold on, you uh, were yeah, you were skiing with the knee brace on, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think I was the only. I had to, well, I had to get dispensation from the Olympic Committee to wear a, a knee brace underneath my cat suit because um, you know so many regulations in, in every sport. Um, so yeah, with ibuprofen and a big knee brace, that's uh, that's how I got through it. Yeah, it's the Olympic dream. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's in, that's remarkable. And then what we want to touch on quickly is. You you've bounced back into the the world of skiing. Uh, how did this play out for your military, your your piloting career? Yeah, well, luckily from proving uh, to the well the ski team that I could get back and I you know managed to qualify and compete in the Olympics, then really the Air Force had to look at me and go, well, we know you've had this massive injury, but um, you we've just obviously proved yourself that you've recovered. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was a case of like, well, we're going to give you a medical category back, and you can continue on flying training. So there I was, twenty three, retired from international ski racing, and then straight into uh, flying training. Very and good. yeah, off I started with you know not much of a break, and and then you know I started to pick off my little minor victories where I got streamed, as they call it, through the. Sure culmination of the elementary flying training course this is the first one uh, I got streamed into fast jets which was going towards being a fighter pilot which is what I wanted to do and how, um, how so, many um what sort of num like what, what you know how compared to the olympics how hard is it to go from that elementary training into a fighter training like what are the numbers uh, per well, year it, in the class oh geez that's a good question you probably it's because not there's um, uh, multi-engines, <laughs> which is things like the air-to-air re- like refuelers, like the Voyagers, and then you've got the helicopters, so rotary. You either get streamed fast jet rotary or multi-engine. So you've got, like, say, courses of about um, eight going through, and then wow. there's maybe, oh, geez, maybe four, five or six of those courses uh, every year. Uh, and then they will they'll only take the guys who make the, uh, the, the top grades into... Uh, fast jets, huh. um, but then also it, there, there's a amount of preference to that as well. So, uh, you know, some guys will just absolutely want to be on helicopters and not want mm. to go jets, so they will try to respect that. Mm. Um, so, it's you a know, small the, club. the whole grading system. Yeah, it, it is Very a small, small club, yeah. Tight knit. And you, yeah. I know you've sort of recently retired, but you went on to have quite a long and successful uh Career, career in flying very fast planes. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I I managed to. I had a little bit of a blip where I, I lost some medical category again because <laughs> oh, no. I had uh, a mountain bike crash on a on a on a short holiday, or which was even uh, more curtailed because of a, a mountain bike crash where the front suspension came apart on me, and I I pummeled face first into the ground. So I crushed all my sinuses. I actually snapped my face. And um, end up giving myself a bit of a Chelsea smile to say in the UK, <laughs> smash my or you know smash my nose. I, I hear that's called the Glasgow smile <laughs> sure. as well. So. Ah, yeah, there we go. Exactly, <laughs> the, exactly. You, you're quite right. Yeah, you're going fast downhill <laughs> on things. Yeah. Stick to the fighter jets. That seems to be a <laughs> <Yeah>. much safer. <laughs> All right, that's well, a safer well, place to be. Yeah, yeah. But people don't want to fly with me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it sounds like you're in, in a much better shape now. But what do you? What are some of the planes you kind of? flow on just quickly so we can get an idea of your kind of 
of jets, sorry, the, we can get a bit of an idea of your kind of military career. Yeah, sure. So I, I went on to fly the Hawk T1, which is what the Red Arrows fly, but the black training variant. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I was an instructor on that where uh, for five years I was uh, flying that. So I went through the course and they kept me back as a, as a young instructor. So I did that for a further three, three to four years. And then I managed to achieve my um, ultimate dream, which was to uh, fly the Eurofighter Typhoon. Mm-hmm. And, and then I ended up doing seven years front line on that. So I was a uh, uh, like a, a line pilot, as they say, a mm. flight attendant, and I got promoted to squadron leader. And then I was looking after uh, a bunch of pilots as, as one of the um, flight commanders on on that uh, squadron. So two squadron at the time. So and I finished that back in November. So I had three operational two, oh, sorry, three um, tours of Iraq and Syria. So that's Operation Shader, as they call it in the UK. Um, and then did you know quite a few other uh, tours. Um, Including the Falklands and uh, Estonia, uh, mm-hmm. Romania. Uh, so yeah, had a had a, an amazing career to be honest. I was just really fortunate with my timing, and you know, intercepted it's um, twenty one different Russian aircraft. Oh. Um, you know, things that sometimes you just have to be lucky to to sort of be in the right position at the right time. So yes, yeah, it's, it's been it's been quite a varied and interesting career. Incredible. In the type of world. Yeah. Well, that's a. Uh... That's all. Just it's it's we can't even imagine it's so hard no, for us to. No, it's it's of... very um it's a very different world I think. But but the so one thing that we're um very aware of is that pilots like watches. Yes, we need to talk about watches, Roger. So Roger, you know, being in the uh, the air force, we've spoken to a few a few guys that sort of are pilots, and we know there's a bit of a a love of uh, timepieces and watches. There, have you come across any nice watches in your your time in the skies? Well, you know, I have actually, um, and I, I've been the kind of person who I try to to get a watch to um, signify, um, you know, at some occasion, you know, so something to remember it by. Um, and so the, the few watches that I've got, actually, um, my Breitling Aerospace Evo was what I got when I got my wings. Oh, very oh, cool. Yeah. Um, it's and such then, a cool watch. Um, and yeah, exactly, and it, it it was pretty good for. I, I kind of stopped wearing it for flying, but I, I did for a period because it's really lightweight and mm. and easy to see as well. Um, so it was you know a, a good a good um, timepiece for that. And then, um, uh, but then what I'm really probably what well, definitely my favorite watch is my Bremont um, Martin Baker three, the Typhoon Four Special Edition. So um, that one was just it. It was the perfect thing to to uh, signify the end of my typhoon career and you know it'll be a perfect hand me down to my boys as well yeah, um, sure. or you know those two watches so you know and on the on the back I had this, uh, an open back um, and I've got on the back as well etched with my service number and then the number of uh, weapons that I've uh, dropped as well so you know it, it means a lot because of all the the you know the professional stuff I've I've done, and um, mm. that watch signifies you know my my career in the Typhoon Force. So so yeah, uh, and then also as maybe Nathan said, I was very fortunate to be involved in the G Shock campaign, the Aviator. So we did the heli skiing um, down the volcanoes out in Chile, <laughs> which was just incredible. And I mean, it was one experience, uh, and then to be able to sit and watch it. In the um, in the box office, you know, in the cinema, it was just amazing. Um, and and that is, you know, my trusty go-to watch that I've. Uh, it's actually the this sort of uh, less fancy G-Shock sports watch, the G W nine hundred. That's like my had been my go-to watch for pretty much my entire Typhoon career because huh. you know I could just bash it around and just just not care. Um, and it was really clear, and uh, you know, it was it was ideal. Um, and then, yes, yeah, was was that G Shock? Was that one of the ones that was designed was made for the RAF, or was it, is this just a regular one? Because I know they had some limited editions. Yeah, so that's right. So they had the um, one that was limited edition, the Aviator uh, one, mm. and but the one I actually wore sort of day to day in the flying job was a. Um, it's it's one that you know everyone can buy off the shelf really at the GW sixty nine hundred, and and it's a, it's a fairly 
um, you know, standard G-Shock black resin sports watch, um, which yeah was 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 perfect. But but I did um, I did wear for you know a lot of the time my Bremont as well. Um, yeah, sure. And got got some photos of it in the cockpit and things. And it's, again, just as more of a you know we'll some those nice memories. Yeah, that, that Bre- yeah, we'll the do, Bremont yeah, military accounts very uh, active with that sort of stuff, aren't they? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And yeah, you know what? I think they actually used it. Um, hey, cool. Um, yeah, I managed to take one in in, in a typhoon. So, but yeah, I'll, I'll send that through for sure. Um, a quick so, question. And then recently, yeah. my sort of yeah, go for it, go for it. I just want to say, so you know, like a lot of marketing around watches, you know, is that sort of pilot's watch connection in like a modern, especially yeah. uh, the sort of plane you're flying very fast. Do you use a watch at all for anything, or is it all on the the displays? Oh yeah, good question, and that's the reason why I went for this fairly basic G shock because in the Typhoon we can pull up to nine G in well, I mean <laughs> uh, it's almost like half a second, I think. So you, you need a G uh, a watch to sustain that, and then going up to fifty five thousand feet as well. Um, oh. Although the cabin is pressurized, mm. your your rate of climb is is, is something else. Uh, you know, Typhoon is very renowned for that. Um, so. But you're right. We have so much information that uh, you know. I would never really glance at my my no watch risk. because we have the time on our on our peak. Yeah, exactly. We have the the personal awareness format, which we have our moving map, and then you know a clock down there. And um, I mean, to be honest, that was the hardest thing of getting my head around the typhoon was all this information because you've got three multifunctional displays, and then you've got your head up display, and then you've got your helmet with um, the visor with all the symbology projected onto the visor. So wherever you look, um, you've got that um, data telling you, you know, what is a target aircraft or what is a target ground. Yeah, and sure. you'll be indicated by, say, a triangle or a circle in, in the helmet. And so, yeah, so we would tend to, I mean, to be honest, we just maxed out enough of that information. That's why we probably wouldn't uh, glance at our wrist very often. And, and I think I did some, um, you know, when we were sort of doing the research for this interview, did I read that you were in? I'm I'm going to get the name of it wrong, but the 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 sort of pilots that are doing that really fast response for if something comes close to you know the UK airspace, was that you? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah, so as a as a typhoon uh, fighter pilot, then that really is our primary role, which mm. is quick reaction alert. So we would sit uh, on readiness for uh, a twenty four uh, twenty four hour shift and. If there was anything that came close to or, or certainly into um, our airspace, then we'd be there to intercept them. Um, so we also did that out of Estonia, so the, the Baltic air pollution uh, around there. And then we did that out of um, Romania as well. Yeah, cool. And were you in the air all the time? To- like, was that a 24 hour shift in the air or from you were sitting ready to go on the tarmac? Yeah, so it was just, um, it was actually a 24 hour shift where you're. You've got all your flying gear and yep. you're in uh, accommodation. So you're just, yeah, you're just sitting there um, to be able to, although I can't say it on, you know, on, on this line. Of course. Of but it was minutes, it was minutes for you to get airborne. So in other words, just as long, you, you pretty much, as soon as you got the call, you'd be sprinting out the door and then you'd get in the, the aircraft and it was already prepped so that you could just fire up the engine straight away and off you go. So, but I can say that the fastest I ever managed it is six minutes from the buzzer going. Um, and then, yeah, by I think by minute 12, I'm on the, um, I've been set to this Russian aircraft, um, and that was out in Estonia. Um, so, you know, it, it was, yeah, serious, seriously pressured the, part of the job. But. Yeah, I, I think that sort of, you know, comes down to the, you know, all, that, all those years and years and years of training come down to, you know, potentially those few sort of minutes or seconds. That's crazy to think. That's the time yeah. that counts. So yeah. you've got the the G Shock, which is the sort of pretty typical beta, the the Breitling and the Bremont, which are all sort of great uh, pilot watches. What have you got your eye on at the moment? I think I heard you kind of muttering, you know, something might be, have caught your attention. Uh, well, uh, so uh, at the moment, this is more of my everyday watch because of um, <laughs> what's happened to me in lockdown. Is I I looked at my life and said, well. The surgeon said I could never uh, uh, run again or I'd always walk with a limp. I'm going to prove him wrong. And that seems to be the way I'm wired. So I've signed up to do an Ironman. And I think it's going to be Ironman Austria next year. So 
uh, because of that, I, I needed an everyday watch to you know to deal with all the the data and the training. So I've gone for a Garmin Phoenix Six uh, Pro Solar, um, and uh, yeah, I'm a big big fan of that, and it's uh, you know it's a great everyday watch. Um, but then, but then for something that um, I kind of looking to in, in the future, like the next purchase, um, family and finances dependent. <laughs> um, I quite like the look at the Mont Blancs actually, um, okay. and I did yeah, have cool. a Time Walker for a short period. Um, so, uh, and I had to sell it. I, I didn't want to sell it, but I had to. So, you know, it's the kind of one that got away. And <laughs> I remember, you know, it's, it's funny how you develop these connections uh, to watches. So, yeah, that might be one in, on on the horizon. Yeah, nice. Uh, Mont Blanc, they, they make some really cool watches. And uh, I've spent a bit of time with the uh, the Fenix 6, and that's really, yeah, cool watch. Yeah, it's 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 great. It's just um, it's it's so easy to to use, and it gives me all the data I need. And I've gone for the six X, so you know when you're when you're training uh, yeah. to have all that data, so easy to see. It's it's perfect. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, love that. What I find really interesting about you know you, you and your story, Roger, is the kind of thread of determination and resilience that runs through everything from you know those that early sort of childhood. Uh, skiing through to the um, your accident through to your military career uh, and you know you're now just mentioning an Ironman let's talk let's switch gears and talk a little bit about sort of that mental resilience because I know you've uh, co-authored a book uh, Speed of Sound Sound of Mind which we'd love to hear about as well and kind of hear sort of how you've overcome what you've overcome yeah sure I mean, I mean um, yeah I, for me it's just these these experiences that I've had, you know, these setbacks, you know, with uh, all the network I have in my my leg and my face, and you know, the things that have knocked me over, and I've I've had to get myself back up, but I've I've had no option but to get myself back up. But most importantly, as well, I've had the people around me to support me and and help me and and get me uh, moving again. Um, but one of the biggest things. The big motivations in my life, and I think that's one of the reasons why you know I'll ne- never stop. And the the main reason for writing my book as well, Speed of Sound, Sound of Mind, is that um, I lost uh, my mum to suicide back in 2010, and you know, obviously, uh, it's just a horrible, horrible thing that I still can't comprehend really, and came out of the blue, completely out of the blue, never expected it. And you know, with hindsight, I think my um, my mum was dealing with depression and and probably had been for a while. But you know, as her son, it was my mum. That that's what she was always like. You know, that's that it was just normal uh, for her to to be like that, to have you know deep lows and then uh, big highs. And um, you know, and, and so from that experience and being completely rocked by it i i realized that one of the biggest things that helped me to get through that was to actually read experiences uh, of other people who had gone through it because the, these traumatic incidents i felt at the time that i was the only person ever to have dealt with that you know it, it just felt so alien like it never happened to anyone else and and then so reading other people's experiences and what they've gone through, but more importantly, how they recovered and, and got their head around, because you've got so many emotions there that you can't comprehend. There's, there's anger. There's obviously the, the grief that's the, just so sad about, about why. Um, and, and these things, you, because you don't, you have so many unanswered questions um, that you'll never get the answer to. So I, I, because of that, I then started to experience the stigma. So I couldn't talk about it to even my housemates at the time. I just didn't want to bring them down. I didn't think they'd understand. And even though they were good mates and I felt I could trust them, it just I just didn't want to, to bring their lives down into my sort of negative space and to this stuff I was dealing with. You know, I was trying to always get through it and be positive and and and, and get through life into another gear, but um, but actually what I needed was to, to have people around me to, to talk about it. So I was lacking that and I felt like I was bottling everything up. I was speaking to my sisters about it and um, I, my mum and dad had been separated for uh, years before that, but you know it still massively affected my dad as well. So as a family, we were you know strong and we were helping each other get through it. But I, um, I decided 
pretty much over overnight, and this was just months after um, my mum had died, that I would become, I would start fundraising and I would start raising awareness of, of mental health because I knew that it helped sharing, uh, reading other people's shared experiences. So I would share mine. And because I was almost like hiding behind these conversations that I didn't have to, I didn't want to have with everybody to tell them what had actually happened. I didn't want to, you know, go through, um, all my friends um, to sort of explain on every occasion that I decided to go to social media and I said, right, I'm going to, at the time I was selling my photographs because uh, I was lucky as an instructor getting my back seat and being able to take loads of cool photos. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, and <clears throat> so, um, so I managed to um, set that up and then using that as, a, as an avenue to explain what had happened to my mom. And and get it out there, and then the the feedback was just overwhelming. Where I had so much support, and then I just continued on this crusade. I I pretty much set that as my as my life's mission, my life's work to try and um, get people to understand what mental health is and what mental fitness is, and and how it's so important that people are open and honest. Now it doesn't have to be like I did in a public forum, but people need to understand they. You need to find someone who they can, or find a group of people um, who they can who they can trust, and they can build that space where they can share and and be open and honest. And and that goes through you know all my walks of life now, from what I've experienced in you know going to war with the Air Force with the Typhoon on Operation Shader and and sharing those experiences so that people can get through it, um, because you know, of of the nature of the job and um. So the fallout of all of that was um, raising awareness. And then someone who I was just chatting to said, "Oh, Rod, you should write a book with all these stories." And and you know, I know you want to help people, um, so why don't you write a book? So that was <laughs> there. There was the idea born of of writing Speed of Sound, Sound of Mind, with a co-authored with Donald McNaughton, who was um, you know I was telling you about my leg when I, when I smashed up my leg. So he was the um, head performance um, coach, um, or sort of, uh, as he's called, a high performance coach. Yeah, sure. Um, so he was the one who really gave me some really good techniques and methods um, to get over that experience of, of breaking my leg and having it rebuilt and having to get through that. It, it really helped, and I really understand or started to understand the power of the mind. And and I think that's why I qualified by six hundredths of a second. You know, it wasn't just a case of oh well, I've got nothing else to lose. You know, it, it had to come from somewhere in all those months of, of wanting that and but then harnessing that that power, um, that, that mental power. And um, so I, I, I truly believe in it. And then after, you know, I lost my mom, which was about four years after that, then I started to see the, the other side of it as well, the so all-encompassing mental health and, and what that is. The, um, so we yeah, wrote the book and again we've had just you know so much good feedback all the money has uh, has gone to charity so everything we raised every penny has gone to charity so we raised over 23,000 pounds now that's great um and that's that includes some you know cycling uh, charity events so so yeah it's you know it's, it's been been a big massive movement in my life where um i'm also now at um, I don't know if Nathan would have said this at the time, but I'm now an ambassador for HeadFit.org as well. So Very we're cool. starting to really, you know, take in how, yeah, it's, and it's so exciting because it's exactly what I've been banging on about for years now, where I've been saying that, you know, it's great that we're tackling the stigma. That is the, the first thing. But now, now we need to understand the language. So what's so important to me, I've got a one-year-old and a three-year-old. So as my boys grow up, I want them in, to be in a world where they can, they know how to discuss their mental fitness, their mental health, and they know how to stay on top of it. Because it's been a skill for me, which I've had to just just sort of learn on myself and figure out from conversations. Yeah, yeah, on the job exactly, mm. and and through you know some 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 good experiences with the skiing and some some horrible experiences with losing my mum, and just trying and muddy my way through the muddle my way through the muddy waters and, and try and figure out how to get through to the other end, and that. You know, I'm in a really good place. I'm I'm just really happy. I feel really uh, strong in in my head and really mentally fit. And yeah. so then, when we look at HeadFit.org, it's that those breathing techniques and relaxing relaxation techniques and and taking people in everyday life and albeit in the British military, you know, at at the moment, 
um, and it's taking them through the, the walks in life and how they get through it and because everyone's different as well and I think that's what's so important is to share those those ways of coping so that ultimately you know the world will be a better place and I know that sounds cheesy but no, that's, that's a very important message people are people yeah. very important message yeah and, we'll and, link and up. people are people aren't they yeah exactly well we'll link up the, the, the book and we'll link up Headfit of course um, but yeah really kind of commendable effort and I think especially now in a time where you know everyone's I think a bit more aware of you know the world and you know we're all sort of shutting our homes and maybe in our heads a little bit so that's yeah. really important really important work yeah. and then we thank you for sharing your story obviously as yeah well. it's really nice of you um yeah incredible no my pleasure my pleasure and um no thanks very much and, and you know it's um I, I think that you know when people I have these sort of very specific stories, you know, um, with the metal work in my leg, metal work in my face. And mm. then, you know, I was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for a really busy day in the office over a rack. <laughs> and, 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 and these, you know, these like times when people say, oh, you, you know, you must be really uh, resilient and you've got through. And I mean, but it really does kind of come down to the support. And I think some of the most resilient people in this world are, are the people who have suffered from you know, severe depression and they've just been in such a bad place and they've just been balling up their, you know, themselves and they've not been able to find someone to, to talk about it and get through it. And then, and they just hold that for so long. Mm. But, you know, what I say to those people is like, you don't have to be resilient. You don't have to deal with that yourself. It's just a normal thing. It's a normal everyday, you know, sliding scale where you can feel mentally fit in one day and you can, not the next, just like your physical health, and, yeah, and it's sure. exactly the same. And it's just, yep. it has to be become the norm, you know, whatever, yep. whatever kind of far reaches of the world we are. So, anyway, but, but that's as you can tell, I'm very passionate about no, that. No, no, 100. And I think it's I yeah, I'm gotta, talking about that forever. <laughs> have the have the language and the you know the the vocabulary to, to really sort of express that and get it across. That's great. Yeah, no, very eloquent. No, and we thank you for your time, uh, Roger. Hey, thanks, guys. You too. Enjoy. And, Thank you so uh, much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks, mate. Uh, I'll look forward to listening to all your podcasts. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, for thanks so much, mate. See ya. All right. Cool. Cheers, guys. See you later. Thank you so much to Roger. That was a really interesting, and you know, clearly he's had quite the life, and you know, it's it's only just begun, really. So thank you so much, Roger. Um, We'll link up all the ways to follow and you know keep up with what he's doing. Yeah, we'll link up his book, Speed of Sound, Sound of Mind. Uh, recommend you guys check that out. And of course, if you uh, want to get in touch with us, you can do it at otthepodcast.gmail.com or on our Instagram, ot.podcast. Dot makes all the difference. Thank you to Major Tom Media. Thank you to Roger. Thank you to you guys. Thanks for listening. See you later. Catch you next time.